the beginning of 804 is, is a chance for the characters in the show to say goodbye. We really want to show just how many people fell defending Winterfell and defending the living. Thousands of them are, are on these massive pyres. The feast scene was a very different tone than the scene in the first episode of the series. Everyone's thinking about what they've just seen and, and the people they've lost. They've just burnt their, their comrades' bodies, so it's, you know, it, it has that kind of appropriate, dark, somber beginning. Danny kind of structures the feast scene in a way. I mean, she's really the person whose emotions and choices are guiding the scene. And things start to shift a little bit when Daenerys calls forward Gendry and, and names him the new Lord of Storm's End. Gendry. It's almost like as the queen, she's giving people permission to, to celebrate what they've done. Things start to relax a little bit. These people did survive and they, they won, they emerged victorious. And so what started as a very funereal scene gradually starts to shift into more of a party atmosphere as people get drunker and drunker. That shift does not happen with Daenerys. She's scarred by the events that just took place, but she's also very much thinking about what Jon Snow told her, and she's really shaken when she sees everyone celebrating with him and talking about what a madman and what a king he is for getting on a dragon. He has love and respect from these people that even with the gesture that she just made, she can't ever equal. She realizes that his true identity is a real threat to her if it comes out. So she's in a fairly dark place, and while other people are starting to try to celebrate their survival and their victory, Danny's not in a celebratory mood. After the feast, she comes to talk to him and with the intention of, of, of making this all work out and of bringing things back to the way they were before. There's a moment where they're kissing and, and it seems like things are kind of getting back to where they were, but it's almost as if he remembers all of a sudden what she really is. It's tense for him. For her, she grew up hearing all these stories about how their ancestors who were related to each other were also lovers and it doesn't seem that strange to her. For him, it is a strange thing. Once Danny introduces the idea that everything can be as it was if John keeps this secret buttoned down and tells no one, She's introducing a conflict that plays forward. From his standpoint, he's already declared his loyalty to her. He's promised her and he's a man of, of his word, but he's also, you know, a family man. And so the idea that he wouldn't tell Sansa and Arya about his true identity, it just seems very wrong to him. I've never been a stock. He thinks he can have it both ways, that he can tell Arya and Sansa the truth about who he really is, and he can maintain his loyalty to Danny, and everyone's gonna learn to live together. I need to tell you something. One thing everybody who comes into contact with this information seems to understand is how incendiary the information is. Sansa's left with a very difficult decision because she promises John that she won't tell anyone. And yet when she's sitting up there on that wall with Tyrion, she knows what will happen if she gives Tyrion this information. She's a student of Littlefinger, and she knows how information travels, and she can think many steps ahead into the game the way Littlefinger did, and know that if she tells Tyrion, it's almost impossible for Tyrion not to tell Varys. And if she tell, I think these are all things that have been occurring to Sansa between the time we see her get that information and the time she passes the message on. Tyrion. What if there's someone else? I think the Jamie brienne relationship has always been fascinating to us because they're such dissimilar characters, and yet there is a real chemistry between them. Tyrion kind of calls out the elephant in the room, and it manages to drive Brienne out of the room, and in, in doing so, drives Jamie out of the room as well. Even as drunk as they both are, it's impossible for them to confront what they're doing with words, even as they're doing it until the very end of the scene. The vulnerability that they show runs very counter to who they are as people. I do believe that when Jamie decides to stay behind with Brienne, it's a choice that he makes with every intention of, of seeing it through. When he hears what Cersei's done, I think that's the turning point for him. At that point, Jamie really has to, has to take a really long, uncomfortable look at who he really is. As much as Jamie cares for Brienne and admires her and loves her, he's got almost an addiction to Cersei that he just can't break. So even though he's given a kind of a chance at, at happiness and some kind of different life for himself, he 
he can't take it. He can't, he, he, he makes the choice to go back to Cersei. Part of the story here is that while we've been concentrating on Winterfell and the fight against the Army of the Dead, Danny's other enemies have not been just sitting still. They've been planning for, for the final battle. We saw in season seven that Kyburn had invented this giant dragon-killing scorpion and it didn't quite work. Kyburn went back to the drawing board and he made even larger, more powerful scorpions. Dozens of them are now lining the walls of King's Landing and dozens more are mounted on the decks of the Iron Fleet. While Danny kind of forgot about the Iron Fleet and Euron's forces, they certainly haven't forgotten about her, and they're just waiting for her to come back. At this point, they would have gotten news that her armies emerged victorious and were gonna head south, and so they're just waiting in ambush for her return. In some ways, the most important thing that happens to Daenerys in four is the death of her second dragon. Now she's got one dragon, and that dragon presumably is just as vulnerable as Rhaegal was. So there's this, the mourning of a child, which is very real to her. And then their best friend is taken. Missandei! Danny knows that once Cersei has Missandei that she's not going to see Missandei alive again. This is a moment for Cersei where she has a chance to maybe to flee and get away if she surrenders. But that's, I think anyone who knows Cersei knows she's not gonna make that choice. Her feeling is if I give up the throne, I'm dead. And so my only chance now is to win. And that's what she says to Ned Stark in season one. When you play the Game of Thrones, you win or you die. Danny is this young queen coming to try to usurp her and Cersei's not gonna give up the throne that easily. She's captured an enemy and this is how Cersei deals with enemies. Tyrion's perspective is, is, you know, while we have these various wars for supremacy and everything, let's not forget about the people who are gonna suffer the most from it. He can envision what will happen to King's Landing if these two armies clash and dragons are involved, and it's an obvious catastrophe. She feels like the odds are actually pretty good uh, uh, for her at this point, and she's willing to roll the dice. I think for Cersei, the only good prisoner is a dead prisoner. She's really back where she was at the very beginning. Emotionally, she's alone in the world and she can't really trust anybody. People have underestimated Danny's strength many times before and, and no one's really done very well underestimating her strengths. Unlike then, she's extremely powerful and unlike then, she's filled with a rage that's aimed at one person specifically. I think what's probably echoing in Danny's head in those final moments would be Misende's final words. Dracarys is clearly meant for Danny. Misende knows that her life is over and she's saying, you know, light them up. <laughs>